We are on page 77 of our book. We're almost finished with this book. We have got this chapter and one more to go, and we will have completed it. And I've really enjoyed this study. It's good to get back to basics. And so, this has been very beneficial to me. We're on chapter 12, concerning the Church of Christ, they do not approve of homosexuals. Before we get started, would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Great God and Father, we bow before your majesty and thank you so much for the hope of heaven, the power of the gospel that's able to change our lives. And we pray to God for our light to shine in this society. Help us to be the salt of the earth. Help us to help this nation turn around. And we pray to God that proper decisions will be made, that the next president will be the one who will bring us closer to you, closer to your word and not further away. We pray to God that you will... Bless us as your people here in Roy City. Help us always to shine as a light and always to speak forth your word in boldness yet in love. Forgive us of our sins and help us always to keep your commandments. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we look at the book, I want to look at Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse, beginning in verse 10 through verse 13. The book of Leviticus was written, of course, to a nationalistic society of people, Israel. And here are the crimes that uh, are sexual in nature. Verse 10, Leviticus chapter 20, The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. The man who lies with his father's wife and uncovers his father's nakedness, both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Verse 12, If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood shall be upon them. Verse 13. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And that is the subject that we're talking about uh, this morning, about homosexuality. And the reason why I read it in the context... Uh, verses 10 through 13 is because it is referring to sexual sin. Now, there were sexual sins uh, of a heterosexual nature, so to speak, between men and women that were a cause for the death penalty under Mosaic law. But also for homosexuality, verse 13, if a man lies with a male... As he lies with a woman, that's a homosexual, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Therefore, we see under the Old Testament law the the, uh, severe penalty for homosexuality in that society. Now, you go on over into the New Testament, and some make the claim, well, Jesus never talked about homosexuality that he never mentioned it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. But Jesus did talk about fornication. Fornication is the Greek word pornea. We get the word pornography from it. Fornication is an umbrella word that deals with all kind of sexual perversion. And that would include homosexuality. So Jesus did, in fact, condemn homosexuality as well as adultery and fornication and all kind of sexual perversion in that word, pornea. 
when he used the word sexual immorality or fornication. He did condemn homosexuality. And Jesus very uh, clearly did uh, speak against homosexuality and against homosexual marriage in Matthew chapter 19 when he gave God's plan for marriage. Matthew chapter 19. If you're ever talking to someone and they say, well, Jesus never condemned homosexuality, take them to Matthew chapter 19. And it says in verse 4, He answered and said to them, Have you not read that He who made them from the beginning made them male and female? That's from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. He did not make them male and male. He did not make them female and female. He made them male and female, verse 5, and said therefore, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. For they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. God joins together in the covenant of marriage a man and a woman that are eligible for marriage. A man and a man can't do that. A woman and a woman cannot do that. Despite what people in our society want to be done. Therefore, that's what's called in our society the traditional view of marriage. And what it is, is the biblical view view of marriage. It's God's view of marriage. And therefore, Jesus very clearly condemned homosexual or same-sex unions as they call them nowadays um, by this teaching. And therefore, that brings us into our chapter, chapter 12. Uh, First paragraph, homosexuality, sometimes called the gay lifestyle, is a major social and moral problem today. Uh, That is a very true statement. Fifty years ago, if there was someone that was homosexual, they kept it quiet. They didn't want hardly anyone to know about it. Nowadays, it's almost fashionable to come out. Uh, Clay Aiken from American Idol has come out that he's homosexual. Lindsay Lohan, one of the famous uh, girls of uh, of uh, the young people that are stars now. She has come out. She's got her a girlfriend. Uh, all these people that in Hollywood, um, uh, it's almost fashionable to go through a phase of, of homosexuality. Whereas years ago, that would be a problem. They couldn't even find work 50 years ago if they, if they had that problem. And also, 100 years ago and 50 years ago, Almost every, without exception, every institution or organization that claimed to be a church and claimed to believe the Bible condemned homosexuality as a sinful lifestyle. Nowadays, there are more and more churches, these religious groups that call themselves churches, that are accepting the lifestyle. In fact, within certain major name brand denominations, there's a civil war going on Uh, between uh, those who are pro-homosexual and those who are against it. It's going on in the Presbyterian denomination. It's going on in the Episcopalian denomination. It is uh, going on even among some Baptists. There are some who are Catholic that are trying to push for that. Um, And so there is wars going on within those denominations uh, Methodist, uh, there's war going on there. Some Methodist preachers will marry two men together or two women together. Um, and so uh, this is something that's becoming more and more a- accepted. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking that just because the very mindset of liberalism within certain churches of Christ, because they want to be like the denominations, that's going to be the next issue that we face in the next few years, among our own brethren. Because whatever the denominations do, liberal brethren want to trail right behind them and do. And so that's something that we're going to have to fight. And uh, it's probably just right over the horizon. So it's a, it's a problem in our, in our society. And he goes on to say, Why should this lifestyle not have the approval of the Lord's church? Because all who are trying to follow Jesus Christ are to approve of whatever Christ approves and approve of what Christ does not approve. 
and not to approve of what Christ does not approve. Here, it might be appropriate for us to be reminded of the wise saying, what we permit, we promote. What we permit, we promote. You know, the homosexual agenda in our society does not want us to agree with them. They don't care if we agree with them or not. They want us to permit them to live that way. They don't care whether you agree if homosexuality is right or not. Just leave them alone. Stay out of their business, they say. Stay out of their bedroom, they say. What two consenting adults do in the privacy of their own home is their business, they say. According to Israel's business and Old Testament Israel, it was God's business. And what went on between two consenting adults, if it was homosexuality, they were to be executed. And you know, it used to be against the law in our nation to be homosexual. You ever heard of the sodomy laws? Texas used to have sodomy laws. It used to be against the law, according to the law of the land, to be homosexual. And now we're having to vote in elections to keep same-sex marriages out of our state. How far we have drifted as a nation. Yes. Um, the change in mentality happened during the 60s, during the, um, the hippie movement, the rebel against authority movement, and, and that whole concept of rebelling against the establishment. That whole mentality, those seeds that were planted there are now growing a crop today. And uh, really those laws for years had been on the books, they just never were enforced. It's kind of like some of our immigration laws. They've been on the books. they just never been enforced as they ought to. And therefore, as a result, we, we run into problems. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It, it was a shame uh, back then. Uh, nowadays, parents say, well, I don't agree with it, but I'll support them in whatever they decide. It's their life. That kind of sissy, spineless attitude that's in our society that says, I don't agree with it, but I'll go along with it because I love them. That's not biblical love. You still can love that individual and hate their lifestyle. And that's the kind of attitude we're supposed to have. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And, and, and homosexuality is it's inherently contrary to that. Exactly. The, the idea of a, a same sex marriage is I, I think if, if the ancient Greeks and Romans could speak to us today, they'd say this is the biggest bunch of baloney that, that they've ever heard of. Yes, and it's dangerous and and it it leads to not only ruin of society but also uh ruin of people's souls as we will see very clearly from the scriptures. Uh, Going on with the paragraph uh, on page uh, 77, as we search to find what Christ does or does not approve, we can find this only in His last will and testament, the New Testament of Jesus Christ. In preparing for that testament, Jesus selected His apostles and sent the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. John chapter 16 and verse 13. Then He told them, He who receives you receives Me. He who receives Me receives the one who sent Me. There's the chain of authority. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 40. Jesus said this because He had all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28 and verse 18. With all that authority, He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by Me. Accepting the authority of God's Word, we must consider what He says relating to homosexuality. That brings us to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 
verses 9 through 11. Paul says, Do you not know that the ungodly or the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Then he gets very specific. He says, Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral fornicator, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, and he goes on to list some more, will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Here the, the testament of Christ tells us God does not approve of adultery, prostitution, or homosexuality. It is a sexual sin and it is a lifestyle that's contrary to the will of God. So in that society, in the Roman period of the first century, that was very heavily influenced by the Greek culture. In fact, the New Testament was written in Greek. You had the problem of homosexuality. And so when Paul went to Corinth and he preached there, there were homosexuals there that heard the gospel. And notice it says, such were, past tense, some of you. But since your conversion, you were washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. They were born again. In other words, they could change. The prostitute could stop that. The adulterer could stop that. The homosexual could stop it. And therefore, a change could take place. The author says in the second paragraph on page 78, for my personal discussion on the subject, I have found that both prostitutes and homosexuals are double offenders and that they are also guilty of adultery. For example, if a person leaves a husband or a wife for a lifestyle with someone of the same sex, they are not only guilty of homosexuality but also of adultery. This is double jeopardy. But wait, good news for the homosexual. Look back at what it was said. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Good news for the homosexual, the prostitutes, the adulterers. You do not need to have a genes transplant. And that's very important because our society is telling them they're born that way. It's in their genetics and they're born that way. Well, are we going to say that about the prostitutes? Are they born genetically predisposed to sell their body? Well, no. Are we going to say that about uh, adulterers? That they're born genetically predisposed not to stay faithful to their spouse? Well, no. Why would we say that about homosexuals? You can, like Saul, the murderer of Christians, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Acts 22 and verse 16. Uh, a murderer, do they have a genetic predisposition to to uh, murder people? No. Our society wants to blame everything on genetics. It's not my fault. That's just the way I was born. Well, we have to understand the Bible teaches that we are born innocent. And we grow up and we can have control over the flesh. And I have known of people, uh, I have had people talk to me that were homosexual before in their past, before their conversion, and now they've changed. That now they don't have the desire, like they did before, for the same gender. Now, that doesn't mean from time to time that temptation of Satan trying to get them pulled back isn't there. But a person can change if they really want to. If they will get it out of their minds, this is just the way I'm born. And uh, because of the philosophy in our society that you are a victim, you are a product of your genes, and basically it's an evolutionary process, and therefore you can't help the way you are, is just simply not true. No one applies that to anything else really except this. And so um, we have to understand that this is something that's contrary to the will of God and not something that we're genetically predisposed to do. Uh, speaking of genes, 
Some are led to believe that homosexuality is in their genes. They are told that people are born homosexual, like being born black or white, left-handed or right-handed. No one believing in God and in the Bible as His Word can accept that belief. Since God, being God, cannot lie, Titus 1 and verse 2, He cannot cause a person to be born a liar. Now let's apply that. Are we going to say that people who continually lie, that they have a genetic disposition to be liars? I've never heard anyone say that about a chronic liar. But then condemn them to hell for being a liar. Revelation 21 and verse 8. God could not cause one to be born an alcoholic, then condemn him for being a drunkard. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 10. Now a child of alcoholic parents can have a chemical makeup which would make them very uh, susceptible to alcohol. But they have a choice as to whether they're going to buy it and drink it. No one makes them go and buy the alcohol and drink it. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the yeah, that's right. So the the problem may be they might have a, a stronger disposition if they ever got started to 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 pull them away immediately, other than a person who who gets started drinking uh, that doesn't have that genetic disposition because of their parents. But that does not mean they don't have control. They can say, I'm not going to touch this stuff. And therefore, the desire might be there. And just like there are babies who have um, parents or mothers who do drugs, and those little babies are born addicted to crack. Well, that's not the baby's fault. That baby has to be dried out, or so to speak, or, 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 or taken that, that's out of their system so they could um, try to live a normal life. Uh, so to try to blame everything on genetics is just incorrect. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. We, I mean, there is desire there, and that's what temptation does. It plays on desire. And, and some people have a, a desire uh, to do certain things, whereas other people would not have a desire for that. For example, you might have one person that has a strong desire to gamble, uh, whereas another person don't care anything about gambling, but they have a very strong desire for uh, alcohol or drugs to get high. Uh, so it's it's the um, it's whatever works to tempt a person, and the devil will use whatever. And whatever might be a temptation for you may not be for me, and vice versa. And so uh, that's something we have to watch out for. The Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices; we're not ignorant of how he operates. Yes. In fact, uh, in fact, there's articles that I could uh, provide, I don't have with me, that, that say that there's really never been any gene identified that, that says this will make you uh, this way. And so um, some, of these, uh, some, of these, some of the research was even done by uh, professors and, and uh, 
doctors who were homosexual themselves. And they're saying, look, there's really no gene there. So uh, we, have to, we have to get back to personal responsibility. And that goes back to Ezekiel chapter 18. We are responsible for our own sin. Now to continue going, God could not and would not have genetically constructed one to be a homosexual and condemn that person to be lost for being homosexual. I never thought when I was younger I would come across a member of the church who thought people were born homosexual, but I did. Back in 1995, my first full-time work was in a very small congregation close to Azel, up in the north part of Fort Worth. Very small congregation, had about 12 members. And um, the man that was very instrumental in hiring me, about three months later, was very instrumental in firing me. And the reason why is because he was living in an adulterous marriage and didn't want to repent of it. And also, he said, when he told me on the phone that I was fired and not to come back, he told me that he didn't like what I said about homosexuals. Because I gave a sermon one time, talked about homosexuals. I said, well, what specifically did you not like? He said, you said they're not born that way. And I said, well, I said, I believe according to the Bible, it says that it's an unnatural desire. Therefore, it's not natural to be that way. He said, I've worked for the sheriff's department. I think he, he worked in some capacity there for many, many years. And he said, I cannot believe that a person would choose that lifestyle because of all the hardships that come upon them. Well, wait a minute. There are people who choose drugs and, and dive into that lifestyle that has all kinds of hardships connected with it. There are people who go out and start drinking, who dive into that lifestyle that have all kinds of hardships with it. And I ask him the question, does the Bible condemn homosexuality? He said, yes. I said, now, you're telling me that God is going to send homosexuals to hell for a handicap. And he said, well, I haven't thought that all the way through. Evidently, he hadn't. Now, the Bible is very clear that this is something... Uh, even if the temptation is there, let's say at a young age the temptation is there, you redirect your thinking. The Bible says we're not made to do anything. We choose whatever path. We can resist whatever temptation comes our way. Obviously, the second paragraph, since God does not accept or approve of the gay lifestyle, Neither should we. All Christians are to approve of what God approves and not to approve of what God does not approve. He makes that clear. I wrote you not to company with fornicators. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 9. Paul writes, We also know the law was not made for righteous, but for lawbreakers, for rebels, for the ungodly and sinful, for murderers, for adulterers, for perverts. And that's in the NIV, that perverts more... Scripturally, it's talking about the homosexual there in 1 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 11. Now, notice what he says in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. To the new Christians, Paul wrote, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth of God in their wickedness. Although they claim to be wise, they become fools. Therefore, God gave them over to the sinful desires in their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another, to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones, unnatural, unnatural desires. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with their lust for one another. Men committing indecent acts with men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. The due penalty for their perversion there refers to the consequence of that sinful lifestyle. Did you know that years ago, AIDS used to be called the homosexual disease? Now, it has spilled over into the heterosexual realm because uh, of the immorality among those who are, 
are attracted to the opposite gender. But that is a disease that primarily was among the homosexuals years ago. And so it is a problem with the perverted lifestyle that they have. And when you read about um, the, the lifestyle of the homosexual, and you know how they, they're pushing for same gender marriage, however, their lifestyle is that of going from partner to partner to partner to partner to partner. That's, that's the lifestyle there. That's the norm. There are very few that are life partners, as they call themselves. They're very uh, open and very uh, free with their perversion with others, and it spreads disease. And therefore, it's contrary to the will of God. You know, you get a man that remains sexually pure until they're married, and you get a woman that meets up with that man, and she remains sexually pure until they get married. Neither one of them have to re be concerned about any kind of diseases. When they get married, they give themselves to one another. They don't have to be worried about all these diseases that are out there. And that's God's plan to begin with. And so uh, this, this is an unnatural uh, desire, and therefore it's against nature, therefore it's not natural and not something that is genetic within them to, to be uh, desirous of the same gender. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that is, that is, that's scary. Yeah. When, exactly. When you step outside God's realm for sexuality... You open yourself up not only for sin, but all kinds of physical problems. And um, that, that's the problem in, in our society. And they think, well, just uh, make sure they have protection. Just make sure they have protection and it's okay. Safe sex, they call it. You know, the, and you know Sarah Palin's daughter has been really uh, had a hard time because of this. And people are saying, well, see, abstinence doesn't work. Look at Sarah Palin's daughter. Sarah Palin preaches abstinence for teenagers to remain virgins. And look, it didn't work. You know why it didn't work for her daughter? She didn't remain abstinent. That's why she's pregnant. Abstinence works 100% of the time. I mean, it just works 100% of the time. Her daughter didn't do it. Therefore, that's why she is with child outside of wedlock. The system or the, the philosophy is not flawed. Her daughter is flawed because she gave in to the temptation and did not remain abstinent. And therefore, that's why she is pregnant. So it's, it's not the philosophy. The philosophy is right. It's biblical. It works 100% of the time. But if you tell your daughter... Remain abstinent, but if you can't control yourself, here is some birth control. You're telling your daughter it's open season. Go ahead and uh, do what you want to do. Just protect yourself. By all means, don't get pregnant. And if you do, we can go to the abortion clinic and have that child killed. This is where our society is gone. Go out and go ahead and fornicate. I don't want you to fornicate. But go out and go ahead and fornicate, and if you do and happen to get pregnant, we'll kill the child. Now, they don't want to see it that way, but that's exactly what it is. Yes. Yes. That's, that is what he has said. He, uh, one of the presidential candidates uh, has said that uh, they don't want their daughters to um, have to have that mistake. Uh, very pro-choice, want, want to be able to have the woman have the right to kill that child. 
And so, yes, parents should, should uh, be teaching their children God's biblical arrangement that works 100% of the time um, and, and not to think in the ways of the world which they see on television. Um, page 80, <clears throat> first paragraph. These passages make the truth powerfully clear that the gay lifestyle is a perversion of God's sexual design for human beings, both male and female. This basis is not something on which our Creator made a social uh, adjustment to accommodate the whims and the perverse desires of people. His purpose was clear from the very beginning. In Genesis' account of creation of man, human beings, He said, let us make man in our image. So he created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Also chapter 2 and verse 25. Male and female. He could have created two men and two women and then told them to choose whatever lifestyle each felt would satisfy his or her sexual desires. He did not. Additionally, God clearly said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united or joined to his wife. He did not say, and be united to his significant other. Have you noticed in commercials nowadays, sometimes when they're talking about uh, a mattress or a bed, and they're talking about a couple in bed, they don't even say spouse anymore. They say your significant other or your partner. Is your partner being disturbed by your snoring? You notice that change? They don't say, is your spouse being disturbed by your snoring? Is your wife being disturbed? Is your partner? There's a reason for that. That's those subtle, small changes in the philosophy of our thinking our collective consciousness in our nation that gets away from the norm being a man and woman in bed and that norm being that man and woman be married. Now it's a partner instead of a spouse. Those are those subtle changes that are, are showing the shift of our nation away from the Bible. God's opposition to homosexuality is clear, not only from His creating man with a need for a woman and a woman for, uh, from a man for a woman, but also in His clear command that a man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 through 24. You see, you have a father and mother. They produce a child. They are united to their wife, and they become father and mother. They produce children. A society of homosexuals can't do that. They cannot reproduce. Do you know that's one of the reasons why they want the artificial insemination? So that if two women who are life partners want a child, they can go down there and get pregnant through an unnatural process and raise that child as two mommies so they can bypass God's design and have two mommies raising a child. One of them gave birth to that child without a daddy. Well, it's not without a daddy, but without an immediate daddy in the proper confines of a marriage between a man and a woman. And I believe that's also pushing the concept of cloning. A couple that are homosexual, they can get cloned. They can bypass the whole reproductive process altogether and have children other ways. This that used to be science fiction is becoming science fact in so many areas. And again, just because we have the ability to do something doesn't mean we should do something. That's why there's something called bioethics. Is it ethical? Is it right to do something just because we have the ability to do something? The Nazis didn't have bioethics. That's why they did all kind of heinous experiments on the Jews. And therefore, we saw what happened to that society. 
Uh, further in the paragraph, uh, uh, about halfway down the uh, last paragraph, Furthermore, God continues His opposition in the account of His sending two men as angels to save Lot and his family from the destruction He planned for Sodom. Lot took the angels into the house for the night, and we read the following account. This is from Genesis 19, 4 and 5. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, Where are the two men that came to you tonight? Bring them out so that we might have sex with them. Genesis 19, 4 and 5. Now these uh, pro-homosexual pastors, quote-unquote, of these denominations say... The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was not being hospitable. That was their sin. They were not friendly. They were not hospitable. But we're going to see that's not the case. Reading on, we find that Lot refused them entry, after which the men inside reached out to pull Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door with blindness so that they could not find the door. And Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed with dense smoke and fire from the land like smoke from a furnace. Verses 27 through 28. Incidentally, the sin of sodomy, which is condemned throughout the Old Testament, comes from the lifestyle of Sodom. A sodomite became a word that was referring to homosexuality. And it comes from Sodom. The land of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, you have a commentary on why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed in Jude, verse seven. Look at the last, next to the last book of the old of the of the New Testament, the one chapter book of Jude. <clears throat> in Jude, God is inspiring uh, this man to write about the doom of those who would be false teachers. And notice what he says in verse 7. He's talking about the punishment that's going to come upon those who rebel against God. Jude verse 7. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude verse 7 gives us a commentary on why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He destroyed them so much, archaeologists are having a hard time finding where those cities might have been located. He obliterated those cities. Destroyed them. And here's the reason why God tells us in Jude verse 7. They were given themselves to sexual immorality and they gone after strange flesh. That's talking about homosexuality. Yeah, they might have been inhospitable too. That might have been one of the many sins that was there in Sodom. They were described as an exceedingly wicked city. Jude verse 7 makes it very clear that one of their most prominent sins was going after strange flesh. And that's homosexuality. The type of fornication or immorality that Jesus condemns in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The final paragraph uh, on page 81. What every Bible believer learns from this record is that not only did God make man for woman and woman for man, but He also condemns homosexual behavior in both the Old and the New Testament, signed and sealed with the blood of His own Son, Jesus Christ. Now, in the very short time we have remaining, we're not going to look at these questions, but we're going to discuss this very quickly. What should our attitude be towards anyone that we know of that's homosexual? Hate the sin, love the sinner. In the same way we would try to convert a Buddhist or a Hindu, or a Muslim, or a Baptist, we should try to convert a homosexual and teach them the gospel. Love them. The answer is not 
to, uh, to beat them up or to find them and to, to hurt them physically. People who do that are, are just as wrong as the homosexuals committing homosexuality. It doesn't make you macho or a man to go out and beat up homosexuals. That is the wrong thing to do. The same as, as it is wrong for those who are against abortion to blow up abortion clinics and kill abortion doctors. Well, that's just as bad as the abortionist. So that's not the solution. The solution is for us to love them and try to teach them. And the reason why I say that is I have had three phone calls in the time I've been the preacher here. All of them from women. Women who are lesbian. One of which was very angry at the stuff that's on our website against homosexuality, which is nothing but scripture. Just stating what the scriptures we looked at, here's what God says about homosexuality. Very angry. I invited her to come. Let's get together. Let's have a study. She said she would never set foot in this building. I said, that's fine. We'll be somewhere and we'll study. She didn't want anything to do with that. One called one time thinking that we were the United Church of Christ. United Church of Christ is a denomination that started in 1957 when several different denominations merged together and they started a new denomination called United Church of Christ. They were very liberal back then in 1957. They're even more so now. And they accept anyone of any lifestyle, of any gender orientation that they desire. Um, and she called because she had moved from up north, and it's very strong up north. She'd moved down here thinking that Roy City Church of Christ was United Church of Christ. And I explained to her that we're not affiliated with them and, and uh, the problems with them, not even realizing she was a lesbian, telling them they accept homosexuality and the Bible condemns that. Oh, she got very angry. Very angry at me. And it's all emotional. No rationale there. And I tried to get her to study and she would not. So it's, it's one of those things where we have to love them, we have to be patient with them, but we are not going to tolerate their lifestyle. A second thing we can do is vote. Vote for a candidate that's in the direction of the Bible though he or she may not be perfect. Whoever might be closer in the direction of what this book teaches is a better alternative than someone who with a neon sign is pointing as far away from this book as possible. And therefore, we've got to think about that when the, the uh, nomination or when the elections come up. It used to be. They, they gave up their membership when their pastor started making things very hard on them by their, the racial remarks that he was making. Yeah, it's, it's political. It's political. We've, we've, we've got to do what we can, and we can vote by not so much voting for someone we think is the best, but voting against someone who's going to be worse and is going to take the nation even, even further away from God. And believe me, I'm trying to reason with Christians who, who are affiliated with, with a certain political party who are loyal to that, who would even agree with what we're preaching and teaching, but yet they think a certain candidate of a certain party is going to be good for the country. I am pleading with them to reconsider and to and to vote as a Christian, not as a Republican, not as a Democrat, as a Christian. Or, don't vote at all. But certainly don't vote in a direction that's going to take us further away from God. Much more can be said about that, but we'll look at our last chapter next week, Lord willing, chapter 13. Read that chapter. The Church of Christ have no organized headquarters or creed books.